We're going to go ahead and get started. We know that there's still some people getting lunches and we'll be coming in. Uh, there's also a room next door where there's going to be some uh, simulcast going on because we had a large number of RSVPs. So I want to welcome you to the first of many Critical Race Studies program events this year. My name is Laura Gomez and I am a professor here at the law school and uh, the faculty director of the Critical Race Studies program for the 2018-19 school year. It's wonderful to see many familiar faces um, in the audience. Um, it is wonderful to be up here with my colleagues, um, the, some of them new and some of them um, old, all of them extremely, um, extremely brilliant and I think you will, I think you will see that for yourselves. Um, I have been teaching uh, 1Ls for 25 years, and there has never been a more urgent time to be a law student, to be a young attorney. And this panel looks at some of the, some of the dynamics in our current political and legal moment that make that so. Um, and as we, as we think about where we are, and as you students think about where you are today, you do have to take a side. You cannot sit this one out. You have to take a side, and you have to be willing to tell your children and your grandchildren what side you took. Whether it's thinking about what happened in Charlottesville in August of 2017, were the sides, the protesters and the counter-protesters, were they the moral equivalent? No, absolutely not. And prosecutors at the state level in Virginia and at the federal level have agreed with that in terms of prosecuting James Fields uh, for first degree murder in the state of Virginia and for 30 federal hate crimes because of the injuries to people he caused with his car. You have to take a stand on whether or not you think Trump's separation of children, even babies, from their parents as a way to deter immigration is a legitimate policy. Judge Sabra, federal judge, didn't think so, right? And he's still working out how we get those children back to their parents, but he said, that is not legal. That policy is not legal. On the Muslim travel ban, which the Supreme Court upheld by a narrow majority in Trump versus Hawaii, you must take a stand. Was that policy an effort to fulfill campaign promises to keep Muslims out of the country? despite the ways in which it evolved over a few iterations. The dissenters didn't think so. Um, they said this was no different than the Korematsu case, in which the Supreme Court upheld the internment of 140,000 Japanese American citizens because of national security. In fact, the dissents making that argument led Chief Justice Roberts and his majority opinion to finally overrule Korematsu. And it's about time. So you will have to take a side. And today, we want to arm you with some ways to inform your decision about taking a side. And in particular, all of us are core faculty members for the Critical Race Studies program, and so we want to, to have you think about this in terms of being a critical race moment. Um, and uh, just a little bit of background. So in the classes, in the 2L class and the 3L class, fully 25% of UCLA students are critical race studies concentrators, 25%. We say, we've been saying, Jasleen Coley, our program director, and I have been saying, this is the Trump effect. 
race is important, race, racial justice is important, and thinking about how race interlocks with an array of other statuses and other um, kinds of uh, subordination is critically important right now. So what is critical race theory? There are still a couple of, I see two, three chairs down here, so don't be shy about coming, four, don't be shy. Maybe you can raise your hand if you have an empty chair next to you, and people can feel free to, to come on down. So what is critical race theory? It's, it's a complicated answer, but I'm gonna give you a, a three-point answer. I'm gonna say these are three major insights from critical race theory, among many, and among different approaches that our panelists may um, invoke, although I've only given them 10 minutes, so they don't have a lot of time to do that. Um, the first uh, principle of critical race theory is that racism is endemic and systematic. It's not something that is passing, it's not something that is, that happens in a vacuum, it's endemic and systematic. And that leads to the second principle, that in order to fight racism, the solutions must also be institutionalized and structural, right? And, and if you just think about that and think about the law's role in that, you can, you can really ask some interesting questions. Um, and then the third point is the idea that law and race are co-constitutive, or that they constitute each other, right? That decisions that we make in legislation, in common law that appellate judges make, in executive decisions, those have effects of creating racial categories and racial dynamics which don't stay fixed in time but which evolve. And what's happening in terms of racial subordination and racial activism and racial projects also affects law. So those are three, three, um, three principles. Um, now, I want to just tell you a little bit about how the format is gonna go today. So each of our panelists is gonna speak for about 10 minutes. Um, and then uh, I am going to um, throw out a question or two and then they will respond to those questions. And then we're, we're aiming to be able to have 15 minutes of time for you all to ask um, brief questions or make brief comments at the end to which the panelists can respond. So our three panelists are first, Professor Jennifer Chacon. Um, who's, I know students like to know a little bit about where professors are coming from. Um, she uh, did her undergrad work at Stanford, her uh, law degree at Yale. She has 15 years of teaching experience in law schools, but this is her first semester at UCLA. So please join me in welcoming her. Our second speaker is Professor Latoya Baldwin-Clark. Um, she is in her first year of teaching law anywhere, and, her, and we're also happy to have her here at UCLA this semester. <laughs> Professor Baldwin-Clark um, did her undergraduate degree at uh, the University of Pennsylvania and did her law degree and her PhD in sociology at Stanford. I'm very partial to those two. Um, she is an expert on family law, race, and education law. Our third speaker is the wonderful Professor Asla Bali, who has um, spent her teaching career of eight years here at UCLA. She is also wearing a new hat starting last year as faculty director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights. Um, her bachelor's degree is from uh, Williams College. She has an MPhil from Cambridge. She has a PhD in political science from Princeton and a law degree from Yale. And she is an expert in comparative constitutional law, public international law, and human rights. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Bell.
and I neglected to say the areas of expertise of Professor Chacon. She is a renowned immigration scholar, um, including in the area of crimigration, which is kind of the marriage of criminal law and immigration, and also an expert on uh, race and in particular Latinos. So I am going to turn it over to you, Professor Chacon, um, and start that timer. <laughs> Um, well, thank you all for being here today. It is an honor and it's terrifying um, to sit in front of this room. Um, and it's ter I, I just wanted to get the terror out there. It, it, I have sat through um, so many dinners and lunches with, uh, with many of you in various settings and have heard about your own work experiences and life experiences. And so I know that collectively, both the brain power and the experiential uh, learning that is in this room is tremendous. And so kind of speaking to this room as an expert has uh, kind of an intimidation factor that is great. So I hope that you will understand my remarks um, as an opening to a conversation, a conversation that we can't finish today, but one that I hope that will continue collectively um, over the course of this year and in years to come. And I wanted to start uh, also where Professor Gomez uh, started us by thinking about uh, critical race theory principles um, as the starting point for my remarks. And I want to take her three points and, um, and sort of boil them down to uh, two points um, and think about critical race theory as having both a critical project and also a constructive project um, and, and sort of thinking about what that looks like. So foundational critical race theory scholars like Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw here at UCLA, Mari Matsuda, Patricia Williams and others posited that law plays an instrumental and a powerful role uh, in maintaining the structures of white supremacy over time. So put differently and as Professor Gomez helped us to think about it, law orders race. Uh, law, laws are put into place to maintain existing racial hierarchies, but law also orders race in the sense that racial categories are defined and preserved and sometimes transformed by the operation of law. So that doesn't mean that the law's impacts uh, and effects operate solely in racial terms. Vulnerabilities and privilege are structured intersectionally. Um, so critical race theorists have to appreciate the impact of law on intersectional identities as well as on intersectionality in structuring hierarchies along lines of race, of gender identity, and sexual orientation, class, disability, and other axes. Um, so this is an extremely shorthand version of the critical race theory um, kind of critical project. Um, there's also a constructive project, a project that focuses on anti-subordination. The work of critical race theory investigates how the relationship between law and racial hierarchy can be changed, right? Uh, how can we change uh, histories and patterns of endemic racism? What role is there for law and lawyers? Is there a role for law and lawyers? Um, and note that there are conflicts, and I think we want to surface these conflicts before we have this conversation, between critical race theory and classic liberalism. Critical race theory scholars have questioned the neutrality of purportedly race-neutral laws and race-neutral legal doctrines. They've used narrative to challenge and question the purportedly neutral viewpoints of lawmakers and jurists. Critical race theory scholars have tried to shift the perspective from the dominant uh, and purportedly omniscient and supposedly neutral voice of the law to a grounded and individualized perspective. And this has been challenged at times by classic liberals as uh, hopelessly postmodern and futile and useless and counterproductive at best. But these efforts to ground uh, law in voices and different perspectives has had important effects and practical effects on how we understand the operation of law. And so I think I want us to take that to heart as we think about uh, the questions that we're bringing forward today. So how might we think about these critical race theory principles against the backdrop of current events? I'm going to take some examples from um, immigration law to help us to think about this. You've probably heard that the Trump administration has made immigration control a centerpiece of its policy agenda. It might have slipped out, right? Um, what has this meant on the ground? One could imagine uh, that it would translate into a massive spike in deportations. So that's one way to envision what this would look like. And in fact, it's more complicated than that. In 2017, for example, the administration formally removed 226,000 people. That's a lot, but it's lower than the number of individuals removed in any given year of the Obama administration. Uh, final statistics are not available for 2018, and the pace of deportation is increasing, so I have no doubt that the Trump administration will at some point outpace at least late-term Obama, right? He's going to catch up. 
Um, but it's notable, and I think we should reflect on the fact that the baseline of removal is so high that this president was unable to match it in his first year, notwithstanding his explicitly restrictionist platform and policies. This has not meant to decline in immigration enforcement. The Obama administration, particularly in its later years, attempted to limit the discretion of enforcement agents by articulating clearer removal priorities and developing protective programs like the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA, for some immigrants. In contrast, the Trump administration has made clear that everybody who is potentially removable, whether at the border or in the interior, is a removal priority, no matter how long-term a resident, no matter how law-abiding, uh, and no matter what legal avenues they might have for immigration relief, including asylum. In practice, what this has meant is that enforcement agencies are given discretion to operate immigration dragnets, using their resources not only to arrest targeted individuals, but also to round up anyone they suspect of being removable. This has resulted in a, a very significant increase in immigration arrests, so a 40% increase in arrests in 2017 over 2016. So even as removals are not necessarily moving faster, the number of people who are sort of caught up in the dragnet, particularly in the interior, has increased. Um, so this has had particularly severe impacts on people on the interior as opposed to the border and on longtime lawful residents with relatively strong equities for remaining in the country. Because of a massive backlog in immigration courts, these individuals have been um, added to long lines for hearings. So they're waiting. Um, and many of them are, are waiting long periods of time. The average time for an, to get to an immigration hearing at this point is over 700 days. That's the average time. Some people wait many years before they ever get before a court proceeding. And because the Trump administration favors the use of immigration detention whenever possible, many of these individuals and many more of them are now waiting uh, detained. So the average daily population for immigration detention reached uh, 40,000 people on any given day last year, which is a record high, 71% of those individuals in private facilities. Uh, the vast majority of immigration detainees do not pose a flight risk or a danger to the community. Immigration detention is hugely expensive, um, so it's really difficult to envision any rational basis for these policies, but they are uh, very, uh, very clear and very clearly in effect. Um, enforcement efforts aren't limited to individuals against whom there are grounds for removal. The Trump administration is expanding grounds for removability as much as possible at the administrative level. Most notably, I want to flag the fact that the administration's proposed expanding the regulation defining a public charge for purposes of deportability. The new guidelines, if enacted, would sweep so wide that if we were all to be defined in this way, about a third of uh, individuals in the U.S. would be defined as public charges. Um, it targets individuals who have received the Earned Income Tax Credit and Obamacare. So this regulation would convert working lawful permanent residents into quote-unquote public charges subject to deportation. So you can see that this isn't just about targeting people who are uh, currently removable, but also expanded grounds of removability to take in a broader range of people who are non-citizens and put them into the category of removability. And we see this, uh, this sort of effort to expand the net of deportability across areas of the administration's policy. So we can think about uh, the severe limits on uh, entry for refugees, lowering the refugee cap so that we have fewer incoming refugees. Uh, we can see the use of family separation uh, as a deterrent as another um, mechanism uh, that's being used to deter uh, lawful asylum seekers. We can see the entry van and the virtually non-existent waiver program uh, for otherwise qualifying immigrants from certain predominantly Muslim countries as another effort to limit uh, what should be lawful avenues for immigration. And we could look at the administration's recent un unconstitutional policy of denying entry to passport holding Mexican American US citizens delivered by midwives, right? So there's this uh, project to sort of expand and who doesn't get to get in uh, well beyond the bounds of individuals who might be uh, present without admission or, uh, or um, squarely meeting a ground of removability. The administration has also converted some U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services agents who typically would be focused on processing visas and immigration services into a denaturalization force focused on finding evidence of fraud that can serve to denaturalize citizens. So this conversion uh -oh, oh, of an immigration service agency into an immigration reduction team embodies the administration's general approach to immigration. 
So this is not an effort to tighten border controls, prevent unauthorized migration. It's an effort to block and remove certain individuals, including longtime residents and some citizens <laughs> and lawful permanent residents that don't fit the administration's vision of the future of America. Um, and it has exposed certain immigrant communities, particularly those imagined to be Latinx or Muslim, to increasing racialized violence, heightened workplace exploitation, and social marginalization. And the president obviously has made no secret of the racial dimensions of his objectives. Uh, he has referred to Mexicans as uh, rape murderers and rapists, although some of them, he assumes, are good people. Um, he has called for a complete shutdown of Muslim immigration. He pressed for more Norwegian immigration and fewer immigrants from shithole countries. Um, he called for a border wall, but only along one border. The racial <laughs> contours of the president's vision are pretty clear. Equally clear is the adeptness of Attorney General Sessions to carry out that project. Um, he recently extolled the racial quotas of the 1920s, which barred almost all Asian migration and severely limited migration of any individual outside of Northern Europe as good policy that we ought to return to. He's made clear his ability to limit migration from certain places, for example, by uh, reversing uh, cases that established uh, asylum grounds that are the basis on which many Central Americans are currently seeking asylum. Um, so he has also increased the use of criminal prosecutions along the southern border, criminalizing migration uh, as it occurs through en masse uh, prosecutions of illegal entry. Um, so the tools of CRT are hardly needed to diagnose the problem. Everyone, including those who support it, can see the racialized dimensions of these policies. Um, where the tools of CRT, I think, are needed is in thinking about how to advocate for solutions. And I'm just going to speak for one more minute if I can here. So what would anti-subordination look like in this context? For classic liberals, a return to Obama-era enforcement principles might be an answer. Develop enforcement priorities that target the billions of enforcement dollars that Congress appropriates each year against non-citizens who have criminal <coughs> records, those who raise national security flags or recent entrants, focus enforcement at the border, allow for historically modest levels of uh, refugee admissions, stop stoking racial fears, make this about security and employment, not about race, adhere to the norms of respecting asylum, push for legislation that will eventually grant legal status to some uh, long-term residents. But the critical scholar needs to think about the fact that the return to the prior era doesn't actually resolve exploitative racism that's at the root of the contemporary immigration control regime. Although prior administrations didn't make family separation into spectacle, they routinely separated families through immigration detention and deportation. Although prior administrations didn't uh, use anti-black and anti-Latino rhetoric to justify and explain their immigration policies, they disproportionately targeted blacks and Latinos for deportation. The existing immigration laws operating in tandem with uh, insufficient labor and workplace protections have routinely subordinated certain immigrant workers by design. A return to pre-Trump baseline is not an answer to an immigration enforcement regime that is the product of decades of racialized criminalization of migration. And in a nod to Professor Bali's coming remarks, any efforts to root out racism and anti-blackness in immigration policy requires us to address U.S. militarism and imperialism, which has played a critical role in shaping migration flows, not just here, but globally. So I look forward to having a conversation with you that helps us think about what migration policy looks like through a CRT lens and thinking about what incremental reforms can be undertaken without undermining broader anti-subordination goals. And the return to sort of a pre-Trump uh, baseline, I don't think, is what gets us there. I'm going to stand up here. Okay. Um, so thank you all for coming today. What I want to talk about that I think is germane to the current moment is the multitude of ways in which parenting itself is being criminalized in the name of protecting the border. Um, and while we certainly see this at the national level, I also want to discuss how this is happening across internal borders as well to highlight the multiraciality of how these policies are affecting communities of color. So this is Kelly Williams Bolar, um, a black single mother of two who was prosecuted and sentenced to 10 days in jail for enrolling her children in a predominantly white suburban school district in Ohio 
a district in which she did not and her children did not live, although her father um, and the grandfather did live there. She made the decision to enroll her children in the predominantly white school uh, because she was afraid for them. Um, crime was rampant in her Akron, Ohio neighborhood. Her home had been broken into, and she did not feel her children were safe in their school. Well, after conducting an investigation, the suburban school district confronted Ms. Williams Volar, and when she refused to disenroll her children, she was prosecuted, convicted by a jury of two felonies, and sent to jail for 10 days. Uh, the judge who sentenced Ms. Williams Volar was clear that her sentence was largely for deterrent purposes. She said, and I quote, I felt that some punishment or deterrent was needed for other individuals who might think to defraud the various school districts. Uh, just as this black mother uh, dared to cross a border while fleeing violence for the sake of her children, uh, many other mothers, also poor and of color, are fleeing violence and crossing the national border. And they too are being made uh, examples of to deter others. For example, this is Blanca Vasquez. Uh, the Houston Chronicle reported that uh, she fled El Salvador's violence where her husband was killed and her sons were threatened by gangs. Um, while she had a legitimate claim for asylum, her claim was initially denied. She was arrested for illegal entry and her son was taken away from her. Um, the same deterrent rationale for publicly punishing parents who dare to breach a school district border um, is also used for parents who dare to breach the national border. Um, as the Attorney General Jeff Sessions declared when explaining the administration's decision to prosecute every person uh, who they deem to have crossed the border unlawfully, uh, if people don't want to be separated from their children, they should not bring them. We've got to get this message out. You are not given immunity. So how does CRT help us to understand these two methods of entrenching white supremacy, one at the school district level and another at the national level? Well, I think that CRT's emphasis on the multiraciality of subordination allows us to see that these two are intrinsically linked. In both cases, the natural instincts of a parent, of a mother, to keep their child safe is trumped, for lack of a better word, by the primacy of protecting a so-called race-neutral border through law. Uh, protecting something, however, that is actually neither natural nor race-neutral. Both parents, Ms. Williams Bolar and Ms. Vasquez, had legitimate reasons for border crossing. Uh, Mrs. Williams Bolar's father actually did live in the suburban district, um, and her and her family often stayed with him. Uh, and Ms. Vasquez had a legitimate claim to asylum, a fact that was later borne out when she was represented by counsel. Uh, yet in the current moment, the border is seen as being more important than these women's claims to a better life for their children. Uh, we can also see this in the similarity of how the enforcers of these laws discount the experience of these parents in order to elevate the law. For example, Ms. Williams Bolar's uh, prosecutor recognized that Ms. Williams Bolar, a single mother, was in a difficult position. She nevertheless posited that the law was more important. Similarly, the administration's chief of staff, John Kelly, too recognized that parents who may unlawfully be crossing the border may actually be fleeing violence. But no matter, the laws are the laws. In both cases, the law is what we already know to be a reflection and enforcer of power relationships. And the law itself is never race neutral. And these borders themselves are not just arbitrary lines. Instead, they define important social relationships of who belongs, who does not belong, who has rights, who doesn't have rights. There is little neutral, too, about how these lines have been drawn if we look back in history. And thus, it's also very little natural or neutral about who is most affected by these lines. Um, I want to make two other points about the similarities of these two stories within the current moment. So first, uh, the president has often claimed that the need to be strong about the borders is because of the threat of an invasion. 
uh, believing that family separation is the best deterrent, the, as the Attorney General intimated. Um, this message can be seen as primarily aimed at parents. Similarly, the, similarly uh, those prosecuting parents of color crossing school district lines often state the same. For example, a superintendent of a suburban Philadelphia school district worried about invasion as well. Um, in response to a question about why punishment was so important, he said, well, where do we stop? What happens if 500 parents decide to enroll their kid in the neighboring school district? In other words, what happens if we get invaded? Uh, second, uh, both enforcers of these laws claim that the invaders bring bad things with them to the point that they take bad actions taken by those who cross the border unlawfully um, as a reason to be tougher on the border. So for example, in Quincy, Massachusetts, a white suburb of Boston, a shooting happened outside of a high school where the suspect, uh, shown up here, was a black student later found to be a non-resident. Uh, the response by the community was to call for tougher enforcement of the school district border, as if tougher borders would have prevented the shooting. This response echoes a current recent situation of the murder of Iowa student Molly Tibbet by an unauthorized immigrant, leading to the president's son to claim, to pen an op-ed claiming that Molly was murdered by an illegal alien and her murder would have never happened if we policed our southern border properly. Using the same rationale between these two uh, different situations shows us how they are intrinsically linked um, in a very racial way. Um, of course, I don't want to overstate the similarities. Uh, Kelly Williams Bolar's children were not taken from her, um, although other poor single black women are having their children taken from them when they've been convicted of a crime, even when that crime is about saving her life or saving the life of her children. Uh, Ms. Vasquez, with uh, legal representation, was able to both reconnect with her child and she was granted asylum. Um, but in spite of these differences, the similarities are striking in that the enforcers use the same methods that make sure borders are used as tools for racial subordination. Um, because these systems of prosecution and punishment affect primarily parents and people of color, Central and Latin American parents at the national border, uh, black and Latino parents along school district borders, they contribute to a system of racial subordination by which parents are discouraged from trying to make their lives better. Instead of being a vehicle for equality, these borders and these laws then reinforce a subordinate social status such that an arbitrary line means more than safety and human rights. I look forward to your questions. Great. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here and particularly to share the stage with these powerful, amazing women. Um, I am going to talk about why it's imperative to center foreign policy in a left anti-racist agenda, which I think may seem strange at a moment of profound domestic unraveling. But understanding the ties between the domestic and the international are, to my mind, at the core of a truly progressive anti-racist critique of the current moment that we're in. Let's look at family separation to understand why. Uh, the Muslim ban is actually the first family separation mechanism that the Trump administration introduced, and family separations are continuing to unfold all around us here in Westwood, which is sometimes called Tehrangelis, as Iranian American families are torn apart by the policies making it impossible for their relatives to travel to the United States, for children to pursue their educations, for parents to join their families, and so on. The demonization of Iran and Muslims more generally is an extension of the racialized global war on terror that presents Muslims as threat and the Muslim majority world as an incubator of violence. This same racialized project unfolds domestically with Muslim mapping programs and surveillance of mosques from Orange County to New York, collectivizing racial profiling and proliferating new national security imperatives that seep from targeting Muslims to all Americans through data collection, airport profiling, expanded powers of pretrial detention, use of secret evidence, and sprawling material support prosecutions, to name just some of the domestic tools of racialized legalism that have been entrenched in our criminal law by the war on terror. Racialized logics of intervention internationally are also at the heart of the family separation scenes playing out at the border. 
What are the origins of the Central American destabilization that has produced the conditions forcing migration that Professor Chacon just referred to? In a word, routine U.S. interventions in Latin America, overthrowing left-wing governments and pro propping up right-wing dictators. One of the places where the U.S. left the largest footprint was El Salvador, where Washington's role in the dirty war of the 1980s involved American military advisors helping the Salvadoran army and providing millions of dollars of military aid to fuel a civil war that killed more than 75,000 people and in which more than 85% of killings, kidnappings, and torture were the work of government forces, including those trained by the United States. Meanwhile, Salvadorans, displaced by that violence 30 plus years ago, organized a gang here in LA, now known as MS-13, routinely referred to by uh, Trump amongst others, which resulted at the time in gang arrests and deportations through the 1990s that relocated a network organized initially as a protection racket for immigrants here in the United States to Central America, where it now contributes to the ongoing destabilization of that region. The vast majority of those migrating from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala today report that they are doing so because they were the victims of crime or gang violence, or their relatives were, and they are fleeing conditions in which their own governments, weakened by legacies of American interventionism and the ravages of the American war on drugs and its collateral damage, are now unable or unwilling to protect them, classic grounds for refuge. But an American public, largely unaware of its government's complicity in wars and violence, and the, the ties of that violence uh, to the circumstances forcing these commun communities to flee, perceive them instead through a racialized lens as themselves the incubators of chaos, themselves the source of unrest, and therefore as legitimately um, the subject of American policies that strip them as outsiders of even the most basic rights to humane treatment, which is the result which is then uh, the, the result of which we then see at the border in the family separation scenes that you know, for most people, uh, basically tormented the conscience through the spring and summer of this year. The ties between the domestic and the international anti-racist progressive agendas in these small examples could be replicated across almost all domains. Of course, it's not that progressive anti-racist politics don't care about international issues, that I think it's difficult to make this link. It's rather that it's hard to figure out a strategy to connect internationally focused issues and anti-war positions with activists working on locally grounded issues of racialization within domestic communities. Some links are easier to establish. For instance, when the domestic and foreign meet around immigration policy, we can see these links more clearly. In other instances, there are also straightforward links, such as arguments to slash the 53 cents of every discretionary federal dollar that goes to the military as a source of funding to provide for things like Medicare for all or free college education. Here we can see how domestic campaigns can tie to international, to a critique of our foreign policy and a broader position of anti-militarism. But still, most of the time, foreign policy seems remote from the urgency of domestic issues. In my view, though, clear foreign policy priorities for a progressive anti-racist agenda are just as urgent as any of the domestic crises we are addressing because they are so tightly bound up to the racialized domestic order we live in. Progressive resistance in this moment, especially amongst leftist movements like Black Lives Matter or the Democratic Socialists of America, has push pushed the critique of American imperialism out of the shadows and into mainstream political debate. What is urgently needed now, though, is a fully developed non-imperial articulation of American policy. American foreign policy that is non-imperial is something we haven't seen literally in over a century. And that is something where a constructive CRT agenda can begin to define what that progressive politics might look like. This policy, a non-imperial conception of American foreign policy, is especially necessary because it would challenge the Democratic Party establishment. Not so much the one in office now, but the one that many are striving to see put in the White House. That establishment is currently still tied to Beltway national security conventional wisdoms, uh, and we need to shake up that logic. In the same way that the call to abolish ICE or the demand for Medicaid for all has done domestically, we need to build a progressive alternative and the institutional supports for it. Such a progressive foreign policy should be shaped around several core principles, namely, of course, and first and foremost, an anti-racist agenda that rejects subordination globally and pacification of communities around the world as a basic American geostrategic priority. U.S. military and economic domination has long been the national geostrategic priority of both parties in this country. This priority has allowed war to distort our domestic institutions, diverting over $700 billion annually away from jobs, healthcare, and education, and producing the conditions that displace people around the world. Privileging diplomatic engagement over military strategy would mean withdrawing troops, 
halting arms sales and acknowledging that there's no military solution to global challenges, whether they be the war on drugs, the war on terror, or global climate change. War metaphors in particular generated by the United States to describe global challenges have produced skyrocketing civilian casualties from Latin America to the Middle East to Afghanistan. They have facilitated the expansion of executive power in this country and bloated the carceral state domestically. The progressive anti-racist goal has to be ending these wars rather than winning them. The Obama administration chose military action over robust diplomacy in all of its greatest failures. Libya, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen in its foreign policy failures. Trump has, of course, doubled down on this approach while also reversing the few areas of success under Obama, Cuba normalization, the Paris Climate Accord, the Iran nuclear deal, to name a few that have now been reversed. Without a progressive transformation of foreign policy, even if control of the White House switches parties in 2020, we will end up with a replay of the critical outcome of the last great anti-racist progressive foreign policy movement, the, the movement against the Iraq war, which produced an anti-war Democrat that simply turned over American foreign policy to the very people his victory was meant to repudiate, resulting in the sprawling expansion of a global war under Obama instead of its repudiation. A progressive foreign policy would look like what then? Just to end my brief comments here, the idea of a constructive agenda which is, of course, the call of CRT that Professor Chacon and Professor Gomez articulated so nicely at the beginning of our framing, would be to build an alternative set of institutions that could fuel a shift in the foreign policy establishment I just described. What would that shift be premised on? Rejecting the use of American military as a global police force with a presumed right to intervene whenever and wherever the US national security establishment sees fit support for social democracy internationally instead of unfettered global capitalism, rejecting neoliberal austerity policies and adopting progressive economic and social policies that provide public benefits and protect human rights, and a push for a strong push for demilitarization, which would end the expansion of American military alliances across continents and instead support inclusive multilateral security arrangements. These would just be the beginning of how you would rein in the military machine that has fueled the form of American imperium that backstops and supports the racial order I started by describing at home. Thank you. Wonderful. So I want to throw out a question now for our panelists to, in a way, just to give you some time to expand on uh, points that you made. But I also I want to preface it by saying, uh, as as you know, as as much as it's a time when there is an urgency and I think a uh, real significance in being in law school, studying law becoming lawyers, it, it can be very challenging just to wake up each day and hear the news. Or, you know, I've had this bad habit of waking up and the first thing I do is look at the news and then when I go to bed, the same thing. And it's like, oh my God, you know, it's just onslaught after onslaught. So I want to think, um, I want you all to share with us some ideas around the idea of resistance. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking specifically um, about how in the areas that you've articulated, and some of you have already addressed this to an extent, but how in the areas that you've articulated can uh, we use law to resist uh, this moment, which many of us, at least those of us who are old enough to perceive it as the, the low point that we haven't seen since the resistance to the civil rights movement reforms of the 1960s, 1950s and 1960s. And I, I want to encourage the, the audience um, to think about law here in the very broadest terms, right? So norms such as the rule of law, legislation at the federal, state, or local level, implementation of law and rules by agencies, litigation, um, whether it's uh, individual client litigation or, or um, impact litigation, and the many layers of legal process that are daily carried out by legal actors most of whom are not lawyers, with enormous discretion in our system. Police officers, border patrol agents, um, clerks at courts, and so forth. What is to be done? And um, why don't we start with you, Professor Bali, and we'll move this way. <laughs> 
Okay, great. Uh, thanks again uh, for a great question. So to my mind, the security state and, the, and what goes hand in hand with it, of course, domestically is the carceral state that has fed American interventionism, criminalized dissent, and placed immigrant and Muslim communities under constant suspicion from in, through institutions ranging from ICE to the FBI to the National Security Agency has to be challenged from within and from without. What does this look like? I mean, there's space for litigation strategies. We've seen that um, in many instances, litigation strategies yielded at least short-term gains, whether it was in slowing the um, establishment of the Muslim ban or blocking some of the most egregious moves around family separation at the border. And of course, litigation is one avenue, that one tool that we'll continue to use. But it has been deeply overemphasized. And as we see this shift broadly across the country in the judiciary, we have to see the limits of investing in litigation as the primary mechanism. What are the alternatives to litigation? Of course, legislation. And what does legislation mean? It means organizing. So first, let me give a quick example of other legislation. There's been an effort afoot for years now to, to put forward legislation to block continuing American arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the offering of logistical and other support that enables and facilitates the war on Yemen, which has left 18 million people at the point at the brink of death by famine, which has witnessed the largest cholera outbreak uh, in modern history, which has devastated uh, you know, millions of people, and we don't even know what the death count is. It's been frozen at 10,000 for over five years because the Americans and the Saudis collectively block a civilian casualty toll from even being collected to tell us how much damage is being wrought in that country. Legislation has been introduced and repeatedly it has been withdrawn, introduced and withdrawn, introduced and withdrawn. So legislation is important, articulating through legislative strategy how to block incrementally particular moves is important, but organizing lies at the bottom of everything that we need to do. How did we get to this current moment? We got to this current moment because of decades of organizing on the right effectively, organizing to gerrymander electoral maps, organizing to shift the ideological orientation of the judiciary, organizing to dismantle the infrastructure providing for social benefits in this country, organizing to take control of the national security establishment across both parties in this country. So the answer to what is to be done, to my mind, is to organize. And the first place we see this already succeeding amongst progressives that have an anti-racist, anti-subordination agenda is in the new cohort that we see running and winning elections, and we can strengthen that tie. The Alexandria Ocasio-Cortezes, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, Andrew Gillum, Ayanna Presley, and countless others, Stacey Abrams, many, many more, that have begun to try to shift the, the face of what it means to run for office in this country, to organize, to regain power, and to begin to shift the balance that we see in the legislature as the first move to try to think about how to take back the judiciary. But if this is to be done, this tide has to be strengthened and furnished with significant institutional supports that today it entirely lacks. I began my comments earlier with an example of that, which is the absence of a clear, sustained, anti-imperial, progressive foreign policy agenda. We just don't have it, it's not articulated, and there aren't, there's a sprawling institutional framework that supports the current establishment centrist way of thinking, the liberal model think tanks and universities, institutions and churches, I mean, from, from civil society through to the highest levels of organizational form. You have an establishment to churn out the ideas that support the basic conventional wisdom that continues to reign across both parties in this government. How do you undo that? Critical race studies programs across the country would be a great start. That would be one possibility. But building the intellectual institutions and building the momentum to actually support these candidates once they're able to get in office and to organize a broader strategy to train a new progressive bench to take positions across the apparatus of the state, including its foreign policy machinery, but also the judiciary, also the administrative agencies. That is the critical task that lies before those of us, I think, who have a perspective that is different than the standard liberal one that is presented as the opposition for much of um, the country and which would simply represent the kind of return to baseline that Professor Chacon described in her comments. Um, so I thought about this question just a little bit differently. Instead of saying what can be done, I thought to myself, what can I do? Um, and so as a sociologist, as a researcher, I thought about three particular things. So the first, um, and I think CRT helps with all three of these, is to understand how the past connects to the present. 
Um, for example, in the research that I do, I learned that appeals to protecting taxpayers um, in the school district context um, were used in the 1960s and 1970s to, uh, for white taxpayers to fight against school desegregation. Um, and now I'm seeing that same thing happening with appeals to taxpayers and residents, again, in the school district context. Um, and of course, appeals to protecting Americans also has a long racist history, and that we need to be aware of that history and having that information in order to be able to uh, resist in the current moment. Um, the second thing I thought of was that as a scholar, my role is often to tell stories that haven't been told or that haven't been told in what I think is the right way. So as lawyers, and one thing you learn here in law school is how to interview, how to take people's stories and craft a narrative to actually humanize the things that are happening to people. Um, as lawyers, I think we're especially capable of that because we interview and we tell stories for a living. And we can continue to do that to resist in the current moment. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, these stories can take the form of not just you can do direct client services and telling a story for your client in order to get the things that they need in this current moment, or you can craft narratives of that systemic injustice. Um, but either way, we can craft these counter narratives, which have often been a tool for CRT to directly challenge the status quo. And I think that in and of itself is very powerful work. Um, lastly, I think it's important for us to collect the information to effectively influence policy. So one of the things that I've been trying to do even in my work is to say I want to learn as much as possible about how these school district border um, uh, maintenances are actually happening on the ground so that I can craft that story to say, look at all the information that I have. You can't contest what it is that I'm showing you. Um, and so those to me are the three ways that I think about how I can actually be helpful in the current moment. And I would encourage you to think about what are the what are the skills and tools that you have? What are the skills and tools that you want to uh, learn while you're being here so that you can really think about what is your role in being a resistor? I want to sign on to everything that everyone has already said, and I don't want to be too redundant. I want to just say a few, uh, a few things about the what is to be done piece. I think there was a question about litigation and the limits of it, and I think we've seen the limits of litigation very clearly manifesting themselves over the past few months. Um, and so we know that there are blocks on that road um, when we talk about a reform agenda. I think it's also, though, important to recognize the extent to which litigation is about storytelling and about sort of laying the foundation for future stories to be told. And I think when we think about what the right has done successfully, they have used litigation in that way, right, as a tool uh, to sort of lay the groundwork uh, that to, to shift sort of the, the national narrative on certain issues um, so that a new range of possibilities becomes uh, the new normal. And I think that we, uh, certainly the progressive left has been less successful in doing that uh, in recent years. And so litigation, while it may not yield successes um, in terms of litigation victories, is also a storytelling tool. So I think we should think Think about it that way, and think about the role of lawyers as uh, as being able to craft particular stories in particular spaces. Um, legislation, I think, is is a, a clearly important uh, tool, and one uh, where I think uh, we've uh, as as kind of the elite law school space has really focused on the federal and on Congress. And what we have clearly seen is that. Uh, a lot of the game is at the local and the state level. It is in the counties, it is in the cities, it is in the states. Um, and I think uh, that far too long has not been part of our thinking um, in the law school space, uh, at, and particularly at elite law schools, uh, and at law schools with critical race studies programs. So I really want us to think about the local um, here. And, and I think we've seen that in the immigration world, um, where local actors and organizers try to, against the press of federal uh, enforcement efforts, try to create and craft spaces uh, for their residents to live um, in, in as much protection and with as much dignity as is possible um, in spite of conflicting uh, efforts on the part of the federal government. So there are these spaces for organizing that we might not think about all the time, um, but that can be very powerful spaces for resistance and organizing. And then organizing itself um, as a tool for sort of shifting the narrative, and I think Professor Bali has covered that well. I also want to think about the way in which we can get sloppy about um, kind of signing on to meta-narratives about, for example, norms and 
the importance of norms, right, which I think has been a meta-narrative of the left in recent months and, and y really years, right? Uh, we, we see the quote-unquote breakdown of norms uh, that Trump has engendered and the need to sort of uh, reinstitute uh, these norms. And I, I, I want us to sort of approach that narrative uh, critically. Um, because some of those norms have been deeply problematic for people of color, <laughs> uh, for the poor. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're all in this room in some sense because we have been winners in a game. We've been able to figure out rules of the game um, in order to come to this space. But that doesn't mean that the game is not rigged. And it doesn't mean that some of these norms are not problematic. And so one of the kind of places where I see this congealing uh, is around the Russia investigation, where uh, we can think about Robert Mueller in two ways. We can think about him as uh, the consummate professional prosecutor, uh, getting all well, the evidence against Trump and his cronies. Uh, we can also remember Mueller as an architect of post 9-11 anti-Muslim policy uh, when, when he was in the FBI. And we need to sort of remember that these two things are not mutually uh, exclusive, they are embodied uh, in the same person. We can think about Jeff Sessions as the person who is the uh, sort of arbiter who's protecting Trump from uh, firing uh, critical investigators um, looking into the Trump regime, or we can think about Jeff Sessions as the architect of a very racist immigration policy. Those two things, again, not mutually uh, exclusive, they are embodied in the same person. So we need to think about the ways in which some of the questions uh, that have been raised including in the Trump campaign, about norms are questions that we should not pass on, right? We can, we can think about uh, the norms that have resulted in the rigged game. We can think about that uh, in anti-racist ways, and I think we should be thinking about them. The fact that questions have been asked in unpalatable ways by unpalatable people should not take the questions away from us and shouldn't uh, take away our ability to think critically about some of the same problems of workers who are not able to uh, put food on the table of, uh, of, uh, of uh, kind of violent endemic problems of violence. We need to be able to think about those in unconstrained anti-racist ways. And I think when we start to kind of uh, digest extensively this sort of uh, the, the, the wholesale notions that every question that's being asked by the current regime is one that we can't tackle, um, then we take some things off the table that we need to be thinking about, not from their perspective, but from ours. Terrific. I want to take some questions from students, and I'm going to limit the questioners to students. Um, and um, if you can say, when you ask your question, whether what your name is and your year, if you're a JD student, or tell us if you're an LLM student. Um, and I'm going to take three or four questions, depending on how long or brief your questions are, and then we'll let the panelists uh, choose uh, which to respond to. So, uh, questions? I don't want to call on you guys either. Yeah. Um, Your name and... Oh, so yeah. my name's Tanya. Um, I'm an LLS student. Um, I just wondered, I think Colin mentioned the term race neutral laws. Um, and I just wondered um, kind of what the extent is to which you think that might be a problematic term in terms of kind of law on the ground. Because I feel like that term is I've seen kind of manifestations of that term being used in various contexts, you know, for example, job applications, or you know, just things like, oh, we're we're going to look at your application regardless of X, Y, Z, when actually X, Y, Z are really important factors. And I feel like there needs to be a shift into taking those things into account and looking at kind of individuals in a much more kind of detailed and holistic way, rather than um, using this kind of monolithic. So Tanya's question, for those of you who didn't hear it, was about the difference between race neutral and race conscious laws, to, to not put it as eloquently or deeply as you did. Yes. Uh, sorry, you in the stripe. Ha, ha, ha. 
others coming into our country and how um, xenophobic sentiments uh, are really forms of like racist aggressions as well. And um, my question <coughs> is a very global question, is um, how, how much does um, a more a reimagined or more progressive immigration policy, how much is it related to the idea of the recommitment to class and class movement? Uh, Okay, and I, 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 yeah, I, I think that that was pretty well heard, so I'm going to not summarize that. Yeah. Uh, my name is Adrian Rios. I'm a one out. Uh, very short question, uh, Professor Baumhart. How would you respond if um, someone said if discriminating against people from outside of the district is more of a classist, not a racist approach? It's about socioeconomic, property, tax, and not actually racist. Um, and anyone else, any panelists that have been thinking about uh, class based? Mm -hmm. Sort of the the old, uh, you know, which is more important here, which is really driving it. I'll take one more, one more question. Yes. Hi, I'm Adi Jackson. I'm a 3L. Uh, I just had a question. I uh, really want to thank all the panelists for being here for, you know, doing the work that you guys do because it's needed. It's not something that happens every day. It's just special being a place like this. But then just with the reality of what the legal profession often is for people, right? not knowing like as much of your superiors, right, often having debt. How do you think CRT can apply to the younger legal professionals, young lawyers, um, recent graduates trying to do work both in public and both for nonprofits where, you know, you're not in as control of the work that you do. I just kinda want to see how we can get into more of a position of doing those critical and constructive projects. Jennifer, can we start with you if you want to take Yikes. one one of those questions <laughs> briefly? Because we have only well, we have not a huge amount of time left. Sure, I, I can. I'll I'll take uh, two, and maybe I'll I'll take uh, chunks of the first two questions. So the first was about sort of the use of the term race neutral law and race neutrality versus perhaps a need for race consciousness in order to um, in order to actually deal with um, structural racism. And I think that's absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, it was funny that in the kind of day after the election, there's a book by a sociologist, Edward Bonilla Silver, it's called Race, uh, Racism Without Racists. And, I re and, and that, you know, a lot of that conversation is about this, right? It's about sort of how we sort of use a language and facade of race neutrality um, when in fact it is is that sort of uh, facade that, that perpetuates um, structural inequalities that, that have uh, kind of pre-existed these quote unquote neutral laws. And that, so some sort of race consciousness is necessary in order to sort of overcome this structural racism. And I, I just thought in the, in the days after the election, my husband asked me, when is he gonna write a sequel, racism with racists? <laughs> and, and, and I think in some ways that kind of, that, that kind of shift is, it has really sucked a lot of the air in the room because we're really focused on a very explicitly racist conversation. Um, but it is true, in fact, that even when you step away from that or remove the sort of overt racism, uh, that you still have structural inequalities um, that require, uh, in some, in, in some uh, instances, uh, kind of taking race into account in ways that take those uh, both historical and, uh, and uh, existing inequalities into account. Um, and the, the question about sort of xenophobia uh, as a sort of rejection of multiculturalism or a need to, you said, I, I'm going to quote you here, a recommitment uh, to uh, kind of a multiculturalist perspective. And I guess, you know, part of me would like to think, when was the initial commitment, right? <laughs> Did we ever have that commitment? You know, where has that ever been? Um, but I think you're right that sort of moving toward a world in which we believe or we sort of take as a given that we can have democratic communities that need not uh, share, for example, a white nationalist identity, right, that we can uh, move toward a more open and inclusive vision of what it means uh, to be a political community. That's absolutely necessary um, to, to, uh, to, to both think how we think about formulating migration policy uh, and, and how we think about sort of structuring democracy more broadly, yes. Okay. Um, I'll take the question that was directly put to me. Um, and maybe one of the other ones. And maybe, okay. 
Um, <laughs> so, and this question about whether this is class and not race, I think is um, almost always a red herring of trying to say that, oh, race doesn't matter, this is only about class. So a couple of things. One, these school district borders were not drawn arbitrarily around class, they were drawn around race. Um, they were drawn at a time where whites were moving to the suburbs in order to escape integration, where there were very explicit property laws that were put into place to keep blacks out of those neighborhoods and those environments. Um, and as a result, we now have a situation that um, one of my mentors, Daria Rothmeyer, calls class race where you can't separate the two um, because they're always intricately, intrinsically bound with one another. And the thing that I'm looking at is not necessarily why the border or thinking about the borders between the two communities, but thinking about who is targeted when one even believes people are quote unquote stealing education, right? And so how do we decide who's suspect? One of the ways we decide who's suspect is that when you have a majority white community and you see someone who is not white, you're trying to figure out why is that person here? What is their purpose in this space? Um, how are they actually targeted? So in stealing education, you see a lot of times that there are very intricate surveillance methods, methods being taken on these parents. Their children are being followed from school to home and get videotaping them and taking pictures of them as they come in and out of homes. Um, how are they actually punished? Who do we decide needs to be made an example of? Because who, is the, who are the people that we're afraid of who are coming in? And I think those things are explicitly racial and not just um, about class. Um, and I think when it comes to, you know, about young lawyers who are not necessarily in control of your work, um, my personal belief is that we still have to learn the tools. And we have to recognize that those tools are from people who have a lot more experience than we do. And we have to realize that when we go into spaces, we're not only um, trying to be as good a lawyers as we are, but we're also educating ourselves and teaching others so that we can go forward and actually make a bigger impact on our world that is not just about us. Uh, so I'll just pick up uh, where Professor Baldwin Clark uh, dropped off and, and finish with a continued response to Ade's great question. I think um, the first thing is, of course, any legal context you're going to go into is going to be one in which there's going to be a steep learning curve regardless of just tooling up exactly as Professor Baldwin Clark just mentioned. But also you're going to be wielding a very powerful tool no matter where you go. First of all, the context of your workplace is one that will probably require some CRT intervention right there, right? just to deal with whatever you and your colleagues are, are facing there because structural discrimination is pervasive, it's everywhere, and there's going to be work to be done in the workplace itself. But also, as you've probably already learned, as many of you already know, the fact that you have legal tools and a vocabulary available to you means you're already a resource to your family, you're already a resource to your friends, to those that don't have access to these tools, and you remain a citizen in this country. My presentation was really focused largely on things that have nothing to do with what your or my legal workplace is going to allow us to change. It's about organizing as citizens, being part of a broader movement that brings these tools to bear on the moment that we're living in and the way it's going to be projected into the future. Organizing is a constant activity and it is a legal activity. I mean, the fact that you have this set of tools available to you means you're a different kind of actor in that movement and you bring a different set of strengths to the table. You have a set of advantages you're gonna walk out of this building with that's gonna enable you to exert a certain kind of leadership and it is a powerful duty incumbent on you, returning to the very beginning and what Professor Gomez said in this moment to say, which side am I on and how am I gonna use these tools in my life, in every place that I inhabit, not just on this or that legal work assignment that was given to me. I think that's the answer to where CRT is going to travel with you for the rest of your life, Ade. And I want to actually jump in and, and make a comment in response to a couple of the questions as well. Thank you for, for addressing those as, so well. But I just want to say a few other things. And, and one is that um, as we think about race neutral and race conscious and, and what this terminology means, and as we think about the term, you used... You use the term, LaToya, multiracial subordination, multiraciality, mm -hmm. and um, your question about, uh, from coming from the South African experience, uh, about multiculturalism, right? And I just wanna, I just wanna talk for a few minutes as we wrap up here about uh, the ways in which we're still, as a nation, working out these, these terms and these concepts, which is, very much part of the critical race theory 
um, project. Um, and and what I think needs to be said is there's a way in which, and and in some ways that was part of what we were talking about today, although it certainly wasn't done as, as an intention to do it, but there's a way in which when we talk about Latinos, we talk about immigrants. But two thirds of Latinos are native born Americans, right? And there's a long history of racial segregation, residential segregation, schooling segregation, uh, police brutality and over criminalization of US born Latinos as well. And so I just wanna kind of, kind of make sure that we say that. The other thing I was gonna mention is that multicultural, at least in the way it's used in the United States context, I, in, in my opinion, is often used as a way to not talk about race. Right, so I think it may be different in the context that, that you're coming from, so that oftentimes people are more comfortable saying, oh, that's a cultural difference, or you know, rather than talking about, say, structural racism. Um, so just something to, to, for us to think about in terms of how we use these, these terms. And then the final thing I wanna say is that there has also been, I think, at the national level, a tendency, and this is, I think, something that I will really enjoy, Latoya, getting to talk more about with you um, um, now that we're going to be in close proximity, um, is, is that I think that there's still a tendency to assume that when you talk about race and when you say racism, that you're talk, talking about white racism against African Americans. And uh, that is is prevalent in the national press where when there's something said, when Trump says something that is anti-black racist, it is immediately called racist. But when he says things that are anti-Mexican, right, it's, 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 it's couched a little bit. It's like, well, he's, he's, you know, he's not being nice, right? But sometimes there's an unwillingness to call that racism, not by the people here, but um, in, in the larger terms. And one example is the shithole countries comment, right? So when he was talking about, we don't want people from the shithole countries anymore, he was talking about African countries, but he was talking about El Salvador. But El Salvador completely dropped out of that narrative and that history that Professor Bali shared with us, right, about our, and we could even go back further than just the, the 1960 to the present involvement of the US in Central America and go to much earlier um, involvement. It, it, it's really important to take that, that history into account and to see this as a, as a broader phenomenon. And I think, I think we in California are well positioned to do that um, because we, we have such a racially diverse society here, but it's not something to take for granted at the national level. I wanna thank you all for coming today. We will be having a variety of additional critical race studies program events over the course of the year, and we look forward to seeing you at them. Thank you to the panelists.